Hi, welcome back to the playlist on exercise physiology or biochemistry, depending on in what context you're watching this video. In this video, we're going to go over the function of creatine. Um, creatine, as you can see right here, is actually a very common nutritional supplement. Okay, In fact, you can have whole courses on whether or not nutritional supplements work or don't work, and there's a lot of evidence, and as we'll go through the rationale behind it, logical evidence and experimental that this this supplement works very well. It works exactly as it's designed to. All right. This right here, this is the chemical structure of creatine. Okay. As we saw in a previous video in some other playlist, creatine is biologically derived from two amino acids, glycine and arginine. Okay. Meaning creatine is actually a molecule that we can actually make ourselves, meaning it's not an essential nutrient. Essential nutrients means you have to get them through the diet. Creatine, however, we can biosynthesize from everyday molecules floating around the cell, in particular, as I said, arginine and glycine. However, it's been shown experimentally and in practice that supplementing with creatine can actually improve exercise performance. Now, we're going to go over the um, biochemical basis as to why that is. And the basis as to why that is is this enzyme creatine kinase. Okay. Now before we go into the details, let me just tell you what creatine kinase does. Number one, it's a reversible reaction. So the creatine I just showed you, that is right here. This molecule is creatine, right there. We also need a molecule of ATP. So creatine kinase, what it does is it reversibly transfers one of the phosphates from ATP onto creatine which makes creatine phosphate, or phosphocreatine. I'll write that here. Sometimes this molecule is just given the name phosphocreatine, although sometimes it's creatine phosphate. Notice that on this nitrogen right here, we've instead attached a phosphate. That phosphate came from ATP, adenosine triphosphate. When we take that phosphate off, it becomes adenosine diphosphate. In other words, we just transferred one phosphate from ATP onto creatine, which makes creatine phosphate and ADP. Creatine kinase as a reaction is reversible. I can also take the phosphate from creatine phosphate, put it on ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to regenerate adenosine triphosphate, but in removing that phosphate, I get right back to creatine without the phosphate. Okay? So that's the general reaction. So how is it useful? Well, here's the biochemistry behind it. We have a lot of processes such as glycolysis. Um, there's some other ones such as the electron transport chain, ATP synthase. A lot of different processes that generate ATP. And if we're a muscle cell that's actively exercising rapidly, we need a lot of ATP in that muscle. Okay? Now, if there's a large concentration of ATP present, ATP has this thing it likes to do. It allosterically inhibits some of the enzymes in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Now, what are the functions of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle? Their functions are to indirectly generate ATP. Okay, so if we have a large amount of ATP, what tends to happen is glycolysis and the TCA cycle tend to be inhibited. Well, if we're an exercising muscle cell, that's not good. We'd like glycolysis and the Krebs cycle to continue at least to some extent. So ATP inhibits those pathways, certain allosteric enzymes. Creatine phosphate does not inhibit those enzymes. It's not an allosteric effector. So, if we want to lower the concentration of ATP in the cell, the muscle cell, but keep the high energy phosphate, then what we do is we transfer the phosphate from ATP to creatine. Now, why do we do that? ADP, not ATP, but ADP, adenosine diphosphate, can allosterically stimulate glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. And on top of that, it doesn't inhibit those pathways, okay? Which is advantageous because we, if we're an exercising muscle cell, we want to continue making ATP. But we don't want too much ATP because it'll turn off those pathways. 
So what the cell does is it conveniently takes the phosphate from ATP and puts it on creatine to make this really special molecule known as creatine phosphate. So it puts the phosphate on that molecule. And it just stores it there until it's needed. And that way, glycolytic enzymes and Krebs cycle enzymes don't get turned off. Okay? So even though that high energy phosphate right here is not in the on ATP, it's not in the form of ATP, it's still a high energy phosphate, it's just on creatine. So in other words, what creatine phosphate or creatine is doing is it's serving as it's serving as a buffer against a short uh, circuiting of metabolism. It's preventing glycolysis in the Krebs cycle from turning off too much. It keeps them on, it keeps ATP production maximal, and then that extra phosphate on ATP is stored on creatine. Okay? Because if we're an exercising muscle cell, or even at rest when it's still metabolically active to, to a, huge, a still a large extent, um, we don't really want to um, turn off those pathways. So how does it work? When we're at rest, so at rest, we're going to move towards the right here because this is an equilibrium reaction. When we're at rest, when we're not exercising, what tends to happen is we're going to have a lot of ATP floating around because we're not, it, we're, muscle cells aren't fully active when you're at rest. So they're minimally active. So we're going to actually take that ATP and store it on creatine, the phosphate on creatine. Okay, so that phosphate is put on creatine to make creatine phosphate and we get ADP. That's at rest. So at rest, you should have the highest concentration of creatine phosphate. Okay, now, onset of exercise, particularly something like powerlifting, something very high intensity. You do have ATP floating around, but you also have creatine phosphate floating around at the onset of that exercise. So immediately when that exercise starts, Creatine kinase is going to go to the left. Notice, to the left is muscle contraction. That phosphate is going to be transferred back onto ADP to regenerate that ATP, and you'll get back the creatine. Okay? This ATP is then used by the myosin in muscles. Remember, myosin is an enzyme, and it hydrolyzes that ATP in order to cause the cross bridges and power stroke, and you get muscle contraction. Okay? So at rest, we put the phosphates from ATP onto creatine to make creatine phosphate, and on the onset of extreme heavy exercise, like power lifting or sprinting, that phosphate from creatine phosphate is transferred back to ADP to make ATP, and this ATP is then used for something like myosin muscle contractions. Okay, so you could actually contract the muscles. Again, why do we do it? ATP turns off a lot of enzymes in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. We'd like to keep those pathways on, so we disguise that phosphate by putting it on creatine in creatine phosphate, and that gives us a large amount of ADP that is that does not turn off those enzymes. It keeps those pathways on. Okay? And then for muscle contraction, we transfer it back to ADP, we get that ATP back, and we can use that for muscle contraction. Now, this is going to be a little bit of general chemistry here, a concept. Creatine supplementation. That means this creatine molecule, we're ingesting a lot of it. Its concentration is going to skyrocket. We're going to probably put it in some kind of shake, drink it, and it's going to be absorbed. And it's going to be taken up by muscle cells. Okay. So it's taken up by muscle cells. Think back to your general chemistry or biochemistry. Le Chatelier's principle. What happens when I, if this is my reactant and these are my products on the right, what's going to happen if I load the system up with a reactant? You're going to force the equilibrium to the right. Here, look, ingestion of creatine. You're forcing the equilibrium to the right. So if I load the system up with creatine, if I stress this reaction, creatine kinase will be forced to produce more creatine phosphate. So what does that mean? But when I, when I eat this creatine as a supplement, I ultimately end up with a huge amount of creatine phosphate. Now, if I'm doing powerlifting exercises or sprinting, what do I need? What nutrient ultimately do I need to do that? I need creatine phosphate. It's not directly ATP that I need. I need a large amount of creatine phosphate to do really good powerlifting and sprinting. Well, if I ingest creatine, I'm going to force this reaction to the right to make more creatine phosphate. And that's advantageous because then I can use more of the creatine phosphate and get much better exercise performance.
okay? And it's been shown with proper creatine supplementation, I can get more creatine phosphate, and I can actually do certain high-intensity exercises for actually a relatively a significantly longer period of time, okay? And in another video, we'll actually look at a paper where we'll actually look at some evidence for that and we'll prove it, that with ingesting creatine as a supplement, you can get more creatine phosphate and you can have higher uh, efficiency of uh, power lifting and sprinting type of exercises, okay? So that's the basis of creatine supplementation and this is the molecular basis behind it, okay? I hope this video gave you some insight on this. Uh, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.